Violin World Written by Tsar Yoshi Chapter 374 The Third Act Eight years ago Silence echoed for a vast sculpted corridor, curved stone arches supporting a vaulted ceiling above a polished granite path bordered with luxurious carpet. Alcoves were filled with priceless statues of bygone monarchs and noble heroes, wall-sized paintings hung protected by velvet ropes, and magical sconces burned with cool blue flame appropriate for the dead of night. There were no windows, and the air was still. Then, with the clicking of talons against stone, a yellow oval of torchlight swept out from a maze-like side passage, and two figures stepped out into the hall. Nightwatch is such a chore, Gaston, whispered one burly griffin to the other, keeping his voice down as if they were the trespassers. Nothing ever happens no matter what. You want to join me and the brothers for a game of baccarat to one more round? It's not like anyone would dare to disrespect the royal temple so much as to come here anyway, don't you think? Who? Nonsense, Levin, the second griffin whispered back, marching with his chest out and turning into a corridor just like the one he had left. Where in the block is there's been an uptick of criminal activity ever since that meteor shower several nights ago? Why, apparently the things have landed and are being searched for and sold in the black market. I wouldn't put it past some scallywag to try something this very night. Wouldn't do to be off-duty the night our jobs finally get exciting, eh, what? Oh, that's the truth, isn't it now? Level shuddered. But Gaston, the things I've heard are that the lowest-class pony folk treat them as charms of good luck. You remember Leaf Blower, the Pegasus from the Academy? I saw him at the Grand Library the other night. He said one fell in the backyard of his folks' place out in the country, so he gave it to his missus as a gift, and the very next day, she went to discover the calling as an academic. Fancy that a coincidence. Gaston fluttered his mustache. An upstanding Pegasus. Sounds as though they're valued to everyone. Imagine if we arrested a smuggler, Level whispered, hugging himself in glee, and kept some of the bounty for ourselves. We could get promotions. Imagine us marching together on parade or getting huge bonuses to buy new houses and wonderful toys. Toys for you, maybe, Gaston huffed. If I got a raise, I'd take a vacation with me own missus. Perhaps a fancy cruise ship out over the sea. Are you sure? Level looked slightly uneasy. There's always the risk of pirates. Cruise ships are well defended, Gaston countered. But perhaps you're right, old fellow. A promotion might not be in our best interest after all. I, for one, enjoy having a job where nothing very well happens all the time. <laughs> Level hung his head. Sounds like that's not in the cards, then. Pity. Speaking of cards... Yes, yes, one more round, you old pool shock you. Gaston patted him heavily on the back with a wing. When there was a tinkling sound in the distance and a shadow swept out of sight around the corner. Both Griffins perked up in alarm. I say, who goes there? Gaston boomed, puffing out his chest again. The ghostly, night blue light from the sconces above them mixed with the warm light from their torches, causing their shadows to flicker and stretch. A gasp returned to them, and a cloaked figure peered around the corner. Gods! Oh, thank goodness! Samir's voice echoed, not at all trying for silence, and they both bristled and ready themselves to reach for their weapons as she bounded toward them. Hold, Gaston instructed, drawing his sword. It's far past visiting hours for the likes of you to be here, madam. Prove your good intentions at once. Or we can arrest her, Level volunteered, running his tongue around the edge of his beak in excitement. The mare stumbled to a stop, throwing her hood off and revealing a white face, pearly striped mane, and long, elegant horn. I grew separated from my group and lost before closing time, she explained, in an accent that perfectly matched Gaston's. I didn't have a map and would have been stuck here for hours. Please, good sirs, can you help me find your way out? I'd be ever so grateful. A broad smile reached Gaston's face, and he put his sword away. A lost admirer, you say, mm hmm? What do you say we provide a tight escort level? Emphasis on tight level whispered, eyes running appreciatively up and down her angular face. The mayor looked uneasy. Sir God, you know that's against the law. Level, level held out his empty talons. I'm just looking. No harm in that, miss. I'm a patron, the mayor said with a note of indignation. And if you could please keep to the punch and help me out of here. A tense look crossed her face and she moved her hind legs closer beneath her cloak. Or more urgently, help point me to a bathroom. A bathroom, you say? 
level back down, adopting an innocent and helpful smile. Well, of course, there's one right around the corner through here. Minutes later, Gaston and Level watched the cloaked mare's backside as she trotted through a smaller, uh, far less ornate entry at the side of a hall. You, Level, are destined for trouble, Gaston said, shaking his head. And you are destined for missing the finer points of life, Level countered. Say, do you think we should have asked her to disrobe, in case she's hiding and stolen artwork or treasure under that obfuscating cloak of hers? Yes, but not for the reasons you truly imply. Gaston maintained its superior stance and settled in proudly to wait. Inside the bathroom, the mayor let out a long-held breath, letting her vocal cords relax. There was one pair of guards that would be suspicious when she started taking too long, but were a lot better than a pair missing or incapacitated. Stepping inside a spacious toilet stall, she lit her horn, locking it closed with an aura of brilliant yellow. Then, ignoring the porcelain fixture at the back, she pointed her head straight downwards, and her horn flared brighter. The magic extended, hardening into a long, wire-thin blade of energy, and she moved her head in a perfect cone, guiding and slicing it through the ground. Eventually, she had carved a plug-shaped chunk of rock that sat neatly in place, but gave perfectly the moment she lifted it with her telekinesis. Effortlessly hefting the slab, she floated it up, climbed into the depression, and dropped through to the floor below. A well-planned silence enchantment on her hose was all that stopped them from clattering as her enhanced mass struck stone more than twice as heavy as a normal pony her size. Silently thanking her magic, she floated the ceiling back into place. Her cut was perfect enough that any but the shrewdest inspector wouldn't be able to tell where she had gone. Teleporting would have been easier, of course, but the underground castle was heavily enchanted against certain spells strong enough that even she couldn't break it without a significant disturbance, and she didn't want her guests to know she was coming. This was far past the point where she could feign innocence with a bit of pleading and some good voice work. If any guards caught her on this level, she would have to work to get him off her tail. The next corridor was empty, and the one after that. Now that she was far enough down, the architecture gave up on vast vaulted ceilings, trading them for ornamental pillars and artwork carved directly into the bedrock. They provided ample cover, and several times she was able to press her black shrouded body against one to avoid detection by passing guards. Wait at an intersection, turn left, descend a staircase nobody had fought a seal, slip around another corner, a locked door no one was attending. It was definitely being watched from the shadows. Hiding around a pillar built into the wall, she shrugged her cloak off. She wore another beneath it, just in case. This would take a careful guess. She surrounded both herself and the discarded cloak of her aura, floating it like a pony was inside, redid her hood, and stepped out herself in front of the door, leaving the dummy back where she had been hiding. Hello, intruder, a menacing griffin's voice whispered far behind her as she walked to the door. She felt a tug at her telekinesis as the cloak was ripped by a sharp talon, heard a confused grunt as the griffin realized he fell for the wrong bait, and in a flash inserted her horn into the unicorn-only lock, performing a key spell. The door slid open and she ducked through and closed it before the guard could stop her, locked out by his own security system. Now the torches were red, and the architecture changed once again, dark and foreboding. The white mare shook her head, but then again, millennia-old immortals could be forgiven for being eccentric with style. The only guards she passed were ornately robed acolytes who walked with their eyes closed. More ponies and griffins and none detected her as she marched through the low-ceiling corridors. She finally reached a broad room with one wall missing, in its place, the top of a grand staircase more than two roadways in width. She was almost there. No one disturbed her on the lengthy climb down, and the final antechamber at the base was likewise deserted. Glancing around one more time, the mayor removed the rest of her cloaks, then released the shrinking spell she had cast on herself, allowing her body to return to its full size. Disguises would be pointless here. Readying herself, she reaffixed her regalia from a saddlebag, cast that aside too, and trotted gracefully for the final arch. Well, 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 a voice like distant thumber rumbled as she stepped out onto a bridge of crystal, fountains casting shapes of enchanted water into a moat around a gigantic central island. Look what the cat dragged in. I wondered if you'd be showing your head around here someday, Sunbud. 
Hello to you too, old friend, Princess Celestia replied, mane blowing in the wind generated by the titanic voice. Don't you old friend me, Sunbot, the chamber's other creature rumbled, stopping a booming. Two slitted yellow skylights opened at a distance, and with the sound of gigantic snapping claws, a forest of one thousand torches came alight, revealing a curved throne resting on crystal spurs over the abyss, taking up a quarter of the space around the central platform. On it, lounged a pony so big she would have had to crouch to fit in the grand ballroom of Canterlot Castle with Pegasus' wings and paws for hooves, and a smile composed entirely of sharp, jagged teeth. But let's hear it from you. What have you got for me this time? Celestia was completely undaunted by the massive Sphinx's show of splendor. Surely you have noticed the cosmological event that unfolded in the past week, Arshiva. I assumed you had guessed the cause and would want to discuss it with me immediately. Garshiva looked unimpressed. That's it? You're not here with the present? I've only won it for two thousand years? She glanced at her titanic flank. Ah, that's too bad, Sunbat. Maybe I should just shrug and send you on your way. You didn't hurt my guards, did you? Celestia frowned, taken aback. Of course I didn't hurt them, and you know just as well as I do why I cannot and will not retrieve your birthright power for you. Do not forget that I forsook mine as well in solidarity. <laughs> Gershiva's voice briefly echoed again, her teeth moving like mountain ranges as she made a lipless show of laughing. Only a thousand years later, and only when little Luna played with things we all agreed we'd never touch again. I never even got to touch mine. Her feline lip curled in disappointment. Yet you seem to be doing very well for yourself, Celestia replied, stiffly holding her composure. And my sister is exactly what I'm here to talk about. Really? Garshiva inspected one of her claws, looking unamused. I figured that stuff was her. Moonglass, we're calling it. Scooping it up and selling it for money already. It sure would be unfortunate if it turned out to be dangerous. A threat from one nation, entering another, after we both agreed to go our separate ways. It almost makes me wonder why you waited a whole week to come tell me about it. Don't you care about your old friends? She gave Celestia a sad kitten expression. I do, Celestia insisted, and I came as quickly as I could. You must realize the vast distance between my nation and yours. My only stops before Hoof were to entrust samples to my top researchers and to pay my sister a visit on a moon. Garshiva's playful demeanor vanished into intense curiosity. Now that's interesting, because he told me we couldn't go back to the moon. Up until now, Celestia sighed, the thousand-year barrier I sealed access from the moon with still holds and will not break for twenty-three more years. However, the barrier she put up in return has vanished without a trace. I detected Nightmare Moon's magic at work in this black material, but when I indulged the hope that I could confirm it, nothing stopped me from using the old transporter. I visited the moon. Garshiva mimed putting on a pair of glasses. And how do you feel about that? Celestia hung her head. She was exactly the way I had left her driven out of her mind by jealousy and the specter she allows to empower her. We did not fight. She did not tell me anything of interest. But her surroundings... She shuddered, her composure finally breaking. She had built herself a house, much like a folded one. And she had a garden of sunflowers. Sunflowers, Garshiva! My flower! And on her table was a note in her own horn that said she missed me. If she has had bouts of lucidity as well as insanity during her exile. A giant feather reached out and wiped her eyes, the sphinx in the throne lazily flexing her wing. Sounds difficult. It's almost like us immortals get lonely when left alone. Thank you for your concern, Celestia replied. Garshiva grinned. It's such a pity you can't return the favor, Sunbud. Yes, Celestia said stiffly. It is. So, how about this moon glass? Garshiva went back to counting her claws. Nightmare moon, evil magic, blah, blah, blah. 
How bad of a plague has your wayward sister unleashed on my empire, Sunbat? Be honest now. If you wanted to stop being frenemies, there's a much easier way. I did not wait to find out, Celestia answered. I do not even know for sure if it is truly off her or what the purpose of such a spell would be. It seems to have bombarded the whole world equally with this material, but the primary purpose of my visit is not to instruct you, but to remind you that the world may once again soon be changing. That every thousand years nonsense? Garshiva looked disinterested. You know, the only reason it happened last time was your fault, and the only reason it's happening this time is because you used a spell to release her a thousand years after she was sealed. This is your problem to clean up. Varsidel's having rumblings in Yakakistan just got their war out of the way, but I run a stable country and don't leave my enemies around to return looking for vengeance. Figure something out. Celestia sighed and hung her head. So be it. I only wanted to tell you that we may have access to the moon once again and thought you might be concerned as to the fate of another friend. There's another thing I'd much rather have access to. I'm sorry, Celestia turned away. We've learned the dangers of tampering with that magic, and if you would like to see more of me, I recommend not filling every word of every conversation with requests for the one thing I cannot give you. Garshiva blew a kiss with her paw. Oh, well, that was a short meeting. Love you too, Sunbat. But before you go, care for a warning from me in return? Celestia's ears rotated backward. Now, not that this is a threat or that I ever try to pressure you into getting my birthright power back. Garshiva suddenly looked insufferably smug. But a little birdie told me that, in that war of theirs a few decades back, Yakyakistan might just have lost those very important things you asked them to guard. A little birdie called one of them showing up unattended in my empire. Celestia drew a sharp gasp. What? Oh, just passing on a warning. Gershiva drummed her claws against the throne, looking disinterested. After all, we both know how bad it would be if this magic got out and about or tampered with. These are not toys, Celestia bristled. What do you know of this? Speak! Oh, there's that royal canterlot voice I love so much. Garshiva smiled benevolently. Just that a certain thing that you like to call the spark was wandering around my lands not so long ago. You need that for your plan to save Luna with the elements of harmony, don't you? Garshiva? Celestia dropped into a crouch. The giant sphinx shook her head. Not so funny when your own toys go missing, is it, Sanvat? I had nothing to do with this. Just passing along a warning. And don't go to Yakyakistan about this, or you'll throw your fragile new government into chaos. But if I were you... Her jagged teeth flashed again. A favor for a favor. Scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. Celestia fidgeted for several minutes and hung her head and sighed. I shall send one pony to search for it. One pony. And they will be cut off from Equestria and receive no aid until they succeed to prevent our foes of old from following the connection back to us. And it may take me several years to find a suitable candidate. Garshiva broadly smiled. Well, that's the first thing better than a no I've heard in two thousand years. Looks like fairness is finally getting through to you, Sanbat. She winked a giant eye. That merits, I think. I'll pull some strings and try to send the sparky away and... I'll let you know if I hear anything more about Yakakistan, but you'll have to come here to hear it. I cannot do more, Celestia snapped. At this of all times especially, when we must prepare the world for assault by- Nightmare Moon? Sounds like your problem to me. Garshiva folded her hoofs. Literally. I'll see what I can do. Sure it would be easier if I could see the future. She stretched and yawned a feline yawn. See you around, Sunbat. And 
Just tell a guard who you are and take the easy way out. Love you too, Garshiva, Celestia muttered, departing in a huff. End of chapter 374